It's the business of solving sociological issues, bringing attention to topics like food deserts and home ownership in underserved communities. And what better person to talk about it all than the man himself, Bishop T.D. Jakes. Hello, everyone. This is Jabbar Young, senior writer and editor here at Forbes. And in a minute, I will be joined by Chairman Bishop T.D. Jakes, chairman of the T.D. Jakes group, his ministries, the Potter House. I don't have to say his name too much. You know who T.D. Jakes is. And we'll talk his business, nine million grant investment to underserved communities, a part of a bigger package with Wells Fargo. All that and more with the man himself, Bishop T.D. Jakes, right now. I mean, but listen, we're here during Black History Month, right? Um, you know, let's open up right, right there. What, what does this month mean to you? Um, and, and when you think of an individual or figure that comes to mind, uh, outside of the notables, uh, who do you admire uh, every time Black History Month rolls around? You know, Black History Month is a funny thing to me because uh, I probably would have answered this differently a, a year or two ago, but with our history, being threatened to be erased and eradicated out of the history books of America, mm -hmm. any crumb or morsel of attention that draws uh, deference to our ancestors and our story and our legacy is important to be maintained. So I relish the fact that at least we have this month that the nation acknowledges that we participated but in reality, American history and black history should merge and become one thing because I don't think you can really honestly tell the American story and not infuse it with black people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As, you know, as, one, one, I'm sorry, yeah, Mr. Goat. As for uh, uh, less notable people that, that I admire, I mean, this is a simplistic answer, but I'd have to start with my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, what the values that they instilled in me. Uh, the irony that uh, my mother grew up in Marion, Alabama and went to school with Coretta Scott. And um, I grew up in a house that focused on certain community values that were infused into the hearts of, of that generation, the civil rights generation. We, we are the children of the civil rights generation. And so uh, there is a certain respect that, that I have uh, that was taught to me by my parents, but it exudes all the way to Nelson Mandela and Dr. King and Fannie Lou Hamer and so many other people uh, along the way. But uh, it starts with what you are taught in the house. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with that 100%. You know, my grandparents, uh, God bless their lives. Uh, definitely set a foundation for my family, the young family, and uh, my co my, my my cousin uh, Tobin Young. I know he was a big fan of yours because he, at one point in his life, was a pastor. So, um, and, and you know, listen, when Black History Month rolls around, I also think of myself pioneers. You know, and and this interview for me is is I'm honored because I remember when I was a young reporter in Philadelphia, and every single Sunday I heard uh, one of my mentors, God bless his life, E. Stephen Collins, who passed away. Yes. And he always used to use your voice. You know, you are listening to E. Stephen Collins on your radio. And I'm like, man, that's Bishop T.D. Jakes. And it was just, it was <laughs> fascinating. So every time I think of him, I think of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm honored. Yeah. I'm honored. Yes. Yeah. I don't uh, know if you remember E. Stephen, but he definitely was a big fan of yours. Yes, you, you, you know, uh, just just a little glimpse of, of him. Uh, to think that younger men and women have had some brush with my life's work is personally gratifying. Yeah. Uh, it speaks to legacy, it justifies adversity, uh, it gives my spirit some tranquility. To note that I have uh, left some impression on someone that helped them to accomplish their dreams and to know that it is possible to achieve your dreams is most meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. And here we are living a dream and one piece of your legacy you just announced, right? $9 million grant uh, that will help transform underserved communities. Uh, you know, bigger collaboration with Wells Fargo, we'll definitely get into it in, in a minute. But uh, explain this nine million grant. I know five hundred thousand of it has already been going, you know, is developed or committed, I should say, to a grocery store out in the Augusta area. 
food desert areas are, are very is a big concern. People don't pay enough attention to the issue of food deserts where people don't have access to fresh foods. Take me into this nine million commitment that you would like to see transform underserved communities. Well, you're right in saying it is in part a descendant of the Wells Fargo deal, but we actually started the foundation prior to having the deal. Mm -hmm. I had the audacity to do a Dallas Morning News interview and say I was going to raise a hundred million dollars uh, and start a foundation. And he said, <laughs> he said, how much of it do you have raised? And I said, <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> he said, normally people have a great deal of it raised before they announce it. You know, yeah. I said, well, I'm not normal. I stepped out on faith and then Wells Fargo and the others, the Mavericks and different uh, banks began to come in and cause the dream to be realized. Uh, and and in incrementally, we will attack some of the issues of which this nine million uh, it makes its debut. And you're right, it's centered around closing food deserts. It's centered around financial literacy. It's mm -hmm. centered around supporting HBCUs and supporting students who are trying to better themselves. Uh, all of that is done up under the umbrella of the foundation, which now uh, is is in its fourth year. Yeah. Uh, and it, it has grown uh, exponentially. And so this is just the beginning. This is not the ending. This is not a one-time thing. Uh, we, we focused on uh, Black Wall Street uh, museums. Uh, we focused on Sola, uh, which is in South Central LA. And I happened mm -hmm. to be out there for the Urban League and saw them doing the, this amazing work right in, in, in a very rough area uh, that teaching kids to code and gaming and how to produce and how to do films and, and all of this amazing things. It, it was in a way an intellectual oasis in the desert of disparity. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 wanna, I, I want to support it. Yeah. Yeah, when you said something interesting about coding, and you know, I was just with the CEO of, of Siemens, Barbara Humpton of Siemens USA, and we were talking about coding and how important it is for kids to do it. And I know part of what you're trying to develop real estate-wise is you want to have schools, right? I know you have one already in Dallas, but more institutions that are able to teach these learnings, yes? Yes. Part of the mission of the foundation centers around STEM and STEAM programs. Yes. So for the last four years, we have been doing uh, programs that stimulated uh, both through the public school system as well as through summer camps uh, and awareness in our community that if we do not embrace STEM programs and STEAM programs, we're going to be left behind. Uh, the, the STEAM is for the arts. Uh, so when you start talking about science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, the stats say that the quickest way to engage young African-American kids into STEM is to add the arts. Yeah. And my own son is indicative of that. He went to school and graduated from an art conservatory and ended up running our cyber technology uh, aspects of our own company. So yeah. that, that it's a gateway. It's a gateway. Absolutely. I mean, listen, in, in, in cyber technology, as you said, cyber jobs in the U.S., 500,000 of them available. So learning that STEM, learning that can definitely steer, uh, you know, kids and, and, you know, hopefully young adults into that industry because the U.S. as a nation, we desperately uh, need that help. Um, but and I love that you're doing the food centers, you know, excuse me, the food deserts, because, you know, health is wealth. Right. You can't achieve the wealth that we want unless you're, you're in good health. So uh, much success there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of one of the covenants that we have in TD Jake's Rev, which is TD Jake's Real Estate Ventures, uh, is the eradication of uh, pay uh, money lenders, uh, pay lenders, pay loan yeah. lenders, mm -hmm. uh, uh, liquor stores, uh, uh, <clears throat> greasy food places, giving us healthier yeah. options, uh, creating biking trails. Uh, ways that we can uh, extend our lives and have access to mixed income uh, housing, uh, mixed use, mixed income housing uh, is some of the things that we are tackling through TDJ Rev. So while it is different from the foundation, they work together quite well because then the foundation provides wraparound services for yep. low-income people to provide yeah. financial literacy and to mm -hmm. inspire their children 
and each organization, though distinct from one, one from the other, they collaborate well together. And I think it is in the nest of the TD Jakes Foundation, the TD Jakes Real Estate uh, Ventures, uh, as well as TD Jakes Enterprises, which has existed longer than the Potter's House, producing films and books and uh, information and content uh, yeah. for social impact. It is in that nestled cradle of, of those parameters that Wells Fargo and I entered into a relationship to disseminate information. And, and quite frankly, Jabari, for years we have had people making decisions about us without us. And mm. often, the, even, even when well-meaning, it has been to our detriment uh, to have a collaborative effort where somebody is on ground level zero with the people that you're trying to help or you propose to help. You, you purport to help uh, is very important because our voice earns us a seat at the table to represent a demographic that is underserved, overlooked, and often denied. Yeah. Well, you know, listen, you took me deep into your portfolio. All of that fall, falls under the TD Jakes group, and I appreciate that. Um, and, and you listen, you have the, the ministry, the enterprises, the books, the movies. You played Abraham in the Bible experience. I know I caught I have that CD. OK, I listen I to it religiously. Yes, of course. I tell people all the time. I say, people, you got to listen to the Bible experience. Blair Underwood was in it. T.D. Jakes was in it. I forgot who played God, but I know you played Abraham. I mean, that was a phenomenal, phenomenal project that was probably before its time. Yeah, thank you for that. It was a lot of fun to do it. And I was honored to do it and get to play Abraham uh, in the Bible experience. Nobody brings that up. So for you to bring that up uh, is it, delightful uh, that I got to do that. I've, I've gotten to do so many amazing things uh, and and kudos to this country in spite of its spots and blemishes and disparities and adversities uh, for a, a young, fairly poor black kid uh, raised in the hills of West Virginia uh, to get to accomplish some of the things that I have been able to do or to be in the room or to meet or to greet people that I've been able to meet is quite humbling and it gives me hope for the future that it does not matter where you start, it matters where you finish. And I think that is indelibly impressed upon my heart and upon my spirit. It was exemplified by my father who started a business with a mop and a bucket and ended up with 52 employees in the 60s. It was impressed upon me every day by my mother who was a school teacher by day and, and buying real estate and property until they renamed the street after our family. Uh, it, this was modeled. And I think yeah. if greatness, if greatness, however you define greatness, is not modeled in front of you, having a mentor with no model won't be enough to accomplish what you're trying to get done. You can't be it if you don't see it. And so having those brushes with your future and your destiny is what the TD Jakes group is all about, is to make sure that we get into communities where kids and people and adults cannot get out and transform those communities. But it's not about buildings or mortar or programs. We're really about building people. And if we put all of these tools together, the tools are there, whether it's housing, whether it is programming, whether it is education, those are all tools aimed at building people. And when, when the people become the priority above profits, above personal purpose, above everything else, then then you, you don't lose the compass of what this is really all about. Yeah. Well, listen, I know it's not where you start, it's where you finish, but right fast, right? Take me back to where you started. You were a kid and you were preaching in front of imaginary congregations, right? Down in West Virginia growing up. And you knew you wanted to lead a congregation early on, right? Where, where did that devotion to do that particular, to do that work, where did that come from? Well, first of all, it comes from God. Uh, I think, and not just ministry, I think everything that we do in life and become is internally, intrinsically applied to our human experience by our divine creator. 
So ministry always gets the term calling, but I think a lot of people are called to do a lot of things because they've been pre-wired to do that. So I think that was in me. Or I was schizophrenic and nobody knew it. I'm not sure which, <laughs> I'm not sure which one it was. You know, well, you, listen, you I put on a suit back in the day, looked in the mirror and tried to be a news anchor. So me and you, Barbara, we're schizophrenic together. Yeah, you, you, you know, uh, what, what a wonderful thing for a child to have a dream when the option was to, could could have been to be a drug dealer or a serial killer or uh, some degenerate. And, and yet there was some higher purpose in us that dared, had the audacity to reach for more. Uh, I think from those meager beginnings in that invisible congregation, which incidentally prepared me for COVID, uh, it helped me to be able to be true to my calling, regardless of the size of my congregation or the presence of my congregation. Yeah. Uh, my my ministry came from inside of me because it started without applause. No. And, uh, and, and it has become the substratum of all these other things, which are businesses. And people say, I'm going into business, but it depends on how you look at it. There are also ministries, a, a house is a ministry. Uh, 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 pr helping a person to find a job is, in fact, a, a ministry too. So though it is incorporated as a company, it still serves the purpose of building people. Yeah, yeah. And then you go and you, you start the, the greater uh, Emmanuel Temple of Faith, uh, 10 people, and then that grew to 1,000. And then you moved to Dallas in 96, and of course, we know what happens from there. The Potter House created 30,000 members and all of that. Before people were with, we, they're looking at this interview, me and you were talking about moving to Dallas. Can you please make the case to an entrepreneur why Texas could be appealing? I mean, you're talking about a state with a surplus. I know its politics is not always up to standard in, in some cases in, in people's opinions, but I always tell people it is a phenomenal state because of the people, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. I told you I want to move to Dallas where you guys are. Can you make the case of why an entrepreneur should choose Texas? First of all, Texas GDP represents 10% of America's entire GDP. Mm. Uh, the GDP of the state alone is commensurate with many countries, major countries in the world. Uh, second of all, you have to understand that uh, at least five people move to Dallas, uh, 500 people move to Dallas every day. Yeah. This, this, this state is exploding with opportunity. It is teeming with bright ideas. And yes, there is a diversity of political and influences uh, and that are complicated, but none of them negate the ability and the potential to live here. We have the best restaurants. We have uh, the widest variety of history. That we have the museums. We have Dr. Ora Lee who who fought for Juneteenth. Uh, we have uh, the, the place where John F. Kennedy was killed. There's so many historical. We have the Bush Library here. We have SMU. We have uh, HBCUs here. We we have so much creativity and diversity and land and mm. access to building and properties and houses and so many wonderful things. I could I could go on and on about Texas because Texas is uh, ripe for business, open for Absolutely. business. Google is moving here. Uh, Wells Fargo has got a site here. AT and T is based here. Toyota yep. is based here. Tesla's Microsoft moved down in Austin. Yeah, mm -hmm. Tesla's moving down here. It's it's actually an amazing place. We do job fairs, and we've had hundreds of people to get jobs right on the spot here in Texas. So I make my case for entrepreneurs. Uh, as you well know, we started an organization called Good Soil which is developing black entrepreneurs and connecting yeah. them with capital and creating opportunities uh, for black banks and SBA loans and all other types of new creative ways to stimulate business. If you're an entrepreneur, not only should you be in Texas, but you should avail yourself of the opportunity. You can have good seed. The reason we call our entrepreneurship a good soil, you can have good seed, good talent. We don't lack any of that. We have no. good seed, but if you don't put it in good soil, a good idea in a bad place will wither and die. And, yeah. and Texas is one of those places. 
that I believe has the economic nutrition and the sociological uh, complexities that are necessary to create a robust uh, experience called life. And you and you forgot the best part. No state taxes. All right. That's what it is. So no state taxes. Yeah, down there. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That is a Listen, strong point. Absolutely. Listen, a uh, few more minutes and I don't want I want to let you go. Uh, but a couple more things to get into. The first is, is how, how do you deal with work life balance? You know, you're a chairman of a company, uh, TD, again, TD Jake's group. Um, you know, you, you're, you have the ministry, you know, you're all over the place. People are calling for you. John O'Brien calls you all the time for advice. You know, how, how do you how do you balance that and, and deal with the demand of T.D. Jakes, the businessman, T.D. Jakes, the man, T.D. Jakes, the father, while also having time for yourself? First of all, the diversity of what I am doing is just a reflection of the complexities of who I am. If you are not authentic, if you are doing something that is not authentically you, it is exasperating and exhausting. So the first thing I want to say to your audience is be true to your core, to who you are. And then it's not as hard to balance authenticity because that authenticity is a reflection of the reality of who you are as an individual. And uh, if you work in an area that is true to who you are, you don't have to take it off when you get home or put it on when you get up in the morning because there is a consistency between work and life when you are authentically yourself. I had yeah. five kids. I raised five children. Th these aren't, I'm not a different person at work than I am at home. I am who I am. And I think finding time for yourself is important. And I've not always been good at that. I will admit that. Uh, because with five kids and a wife and a church, uh, I have always put others ahead of myself. But as I get older, my children are teaching me to come back around and, and take time for yourself. And so that's yeah. the fruit of my labor. That's my harvest. I might not have gotten it every week or every day, but now at a time that as I get older and need it more diligently, the people that I sacrificed it for are now making it possible for me to enjoy it. Yeah. H has your faith been tested lately? And, and if so, how do, how do you deal with it? Oh, yes. I've, there was a time you would ask me that question. I would have said no. But but yes, there have been moments uh, that my faith has been tested and, and tried. And I, I would like to tell you that I dealt with it. But, I, but the truth of the matter is God dealt with it. Uh, he has a way of proving his relevance in your life as you continue to live. Uh, my faith was tested by the death of a loved one that, that struck me on such an emotional level that I questioned the relevancy of my faith, but ultimately found out that cleaving to my faith was more productive than questioning it. And, yeah. and I think when you have a relationship with God, rather than just religion itself. Relationship is really personal, has nothing to do with synagogues, mosques, or churches, has everything to do with communication and relationship. And, and like any relationship, today I'm angry with you. I don't like what you did. I don't like who you took out of my life. I don't like that I lost my job. Honesty in the relationship. And then through communion and, and prayer and reflection and further experiences in life, you begin to see that his plan was better than yours and your trust is renewed and you move forward. Absolutely. Well, listen, you had Tyler Perry had faith in you. You take me inside of that deal as we switch back into the business uh, uh, of the real estate um, that, that that's in, you know, TD Jakes uh, in your real estate portfolio, right? You're building homes and, and developing in South Florida area. You already have dollars. And now you have that army base in, in, uh, in the Atlanta area. I remember in 23, May 2023, you struck that uh, a deal to have 95 acres you wanted to develop, turn it into a mixed use, mixed income community. Uh, you know, again, partnering with Wells Fargo there. But Tyler Perry is the person who had rights of first refusal for that property. And you, you, you convinced him to give it to you. And a quote that you used to one of our Forbes contributors, you said, black power brokers working together to solve black problems. And I love that quote. 
Take me on the inside of that Tyler Perry deal. Did you tell him, look, if you don't give it to me, Tyler, I'm going to talk to God and you're not going to get into that. Uh, what was that like for you to, to, to get him to give up that property? First of all, I want to say to you that relationships are our greatest resource. I think that statement is underutilized in our society today. We, we, we really don't have relationships. We have transactions. We're transactional in the way that we deal with people. We are focused on with them what's in it for me. Yeah. Build relationships with people that you don't need so that when you do need them, there is an amicable uh, relationship that precedes a request. So having said that, on the basis of the strength of those many relationships, I said to him, uh, you have the Rofo. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you give it to me? If I can't pull it off, I'll give it back. And because he knows I'm a person of my word and, and he wasn't particularly interested in the 95 acres at the time, uh, uh, he, he gave me the right of first offer. Yeah. And so on the premise of the right of first offer, though we are not partnering on the land, we are neighbors one against the other in the development of, of, a, of a, an area and a community. I won't say that it's blighted because I was refreshingly surprised to see that there, there's a lot going on in that area, but it has not been given the attention and the, the love and the TLC that it needs to be all that it can be. And I, he's working on the business and the movies and the films. I'm working on the grocery stores and the mixed use and the bike trails and the yeah. the uh, multifamily and the senior living and all the things that are possible that you can do with 95 acres of land that's right on the MARTA systems and very, very close to downtown Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah, the transportation part was, was was very key because when you put train stations and you build around them, obviously development is, is going to stretch. Uh, again, going into that partnership with Wells Fargo, right? I mean, this was a $1 billion uh, commitment to, you know, uh, help finance this. And as I'm reading that press release, I see the word it could open up or could generate a $1 billion in financing. And I ask, why do you trust Wells Fargo this? Because, you know, Bishop, their past is what it is, right? I mean, I'm sure that they're trying to change the company, but this is the same bank that was denying black mortgages in 2020, 47%. They were denying half of them, right, or nearly half. This is the same bank that had to settle charges in 2020, 2012, uh, paid $140 million settlement for claims that it, it, it had high fees and high mortgage rates for black people. And and this is a bank that has $1 trillion in assets under management, $140, $140 billion market cap, and yet I see the word could generate $1 billion. Why not it will generate $1 billion? And why do you trust Wells Fargo? Tell people why they should, again, trust Wells Fargo, especially after the history. Oh, I would never try to be Wells Fargo's voice to yeah. tell people why they should trust Wells Fargo or any other bank. Yeah. Uh, that That's not my role in our relationship. Yeah. Uh, you have to do due diligence. Uh, you Again, you do business with people, not yes. buildings. I met Charlie Scharf. He was their new CEO. Uh, I found him to be believable and committed and focused to make the corrections that preceded his leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we set out to do a partnership that at least regardless of which direction the, bis, the, the bank goes in in the future, at least one billion of those dollars have been sequestered and set aside to accomplish some of the many tasks that I have for it to do. Uh, right. That does not mean that there won't be mistakes made by any bank. I can't vouch, especially a bank that has 250,000 employees. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to do something crazy. Yeah. Okay. So, so I am not here to represent Wells Fargo. I am here to represent our people in an ongoing endeavor to build equity, uh, to build opportunity, to build the com commodity of affordable housing. And Wells Fargo is standing alongside to provide capital. Now, the question to about the could be is not an out clause in the announcement. Real estate fluctuates, interest right. rates fluctuate, uh, lifespan fluctuates. Yeah. Suppose I die, uh, suppose we don't finish, suppose something happens. You know, life is full of possibility. And, and it, the could, could go over 
one billion dollars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we are uh, committed to work together, and so far, so far, I have found this to be very good. I want to emphasize also that I am not on the mortgage end of the business. No, I am on the I'm on the wholesale end of the business from the perspective of. We are putting in infrastructure. We are putting in grocery stores. We are putting in hotels. We are building houses. But who the homeowner chooses to get the mortgage from is totally up to them. I'm not involved with that part of it at all. The partnership deals with creating the opportunity. The consumer can choose the lender of their choice. And I believe if we ever consider uh, redemption, being called out on the carpet, which they were, uh, if we say that we we have rights to reparations, we can't say that we want reparations, and then when people try to repair, we won't receive it. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I get you out of here on this, right? Good to Great, Jim Collins wrote a phenomenal book, Good to Great, it's a business book. I love that book, I'm sure you probably read it. Um, what's the difference between a, a great, uh, ministry leader, uh, the good ministry leader and a great ministry leader? Wow. First of all, I know Jim Collins. I've read the book. I'm very familiar Mm -hmm. with him. I think he's brilliant. I love his philosophies, his ideas and so forth. I think that's very important. When you brought it down to ministry leader, I think the answer, the difference between good to great depends on the individual. People are not born ministry leaders. They're born people. And so uh, that's not a cop out, but a great Marvin Winans I could never be because I can't sing like him. Mm -hmm. Uh, A a great civil rights leader like Dr. King, I could not be because that's not my mission. Greatness has to do with how you are individually wired and how you develop the courage and the stamina and the resilience to produce the authentic giftings that have been breathed into you, that you exhale them to the degree that you impact not only your congregation, but your community, your country, and if you are lucky, your entire world. Not everybody gets to influence the whole world. Not everybody gets to influence the whole country, but it starts with you. It proceeds out to your church if you're a minister or your business if you're an entrepreneur integrity, doing what you said, admitting when you're wrong, correcting your mistakes. Uh, We're not looking for perfect people. We're looking for uh, people of purpose and people of intensity. And I think they make, they become great because they were authentic to what was planted in them to begin with. Yeah. The business of solving sociological issues. I am a fan of that. I will be monitoring it, monitoring, you know, the the Jake's group and and how you guys do. I'm a fan. Again, thank you so much for the time, Chairman Bishop T.D. Jakes. And uh, when I'm back down in Dallas, I'll stop through the church and then we'll go around and, you know, we'll try to get people moving down there with you because I told you I love the state down. You make a fine deacon. Yes. Well, well, thank you. you I appreciate that. I appreciate it. I want to be a great journalist. I want to be a great journalist, though, right? <laughs> you're, you're already a great journalist. You make a fine deacon. Thank well, you I appreciate it. I enjoyed the interview. It's, it's a real pleasure. Visit Absolutely. Bishop. Appreciate it. Take care.